on. This morning I want to bring a very practical type message this morning and tonight. We will be both very practical types of truth from the Word of God that I hope will be a help and a blessing to us. I want to bring a message here out of James chapter number 1, how to defeat temptation. How to defeat temptation. Father, I pray you bless uh, in our time together here as we open up the Word of God and break the bread of life. Father, we're thankful for the truths we have in the Bible to help us where we live every day. Uh, these are not just truths that will help us for eternity, though they are, they're there in the Word of God, but I'm thankful you give us life-giving truths to help us uh, as we live for you in the day and time in which we do. I pray you bless. In Jesus' name, amen. In the long history of con artists, George C. Parker holds a special place of dishonor. He is remembered as one of, the most, one of the most successful and daring swindlers in American history. He set up an office in New York City and sold, I quote unquote, sold some of the city's most famous attractions to tourists. In other words, tourists would come in and they wouldn't know any better. And he had an office set up and he would convince people that he owned these things and he would actually sell them things that he had no business selling them. His favorite and number one object that he sold over and over and over again to many people, he sold the Brooklyn Bridge. But he also sold the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> he sold Madison Square Garden. He sold Madison Square Garden, and there was one occasion where he sold someone Grant's tomb. He produced elaborately forged documents and deeds to convince his targets that he was a rightful owner of the landmarks that he was selling. Parker was so persuasive that on more than one occasion. Police had to come in and explain why the new owners of the Brooklyn Bridge could not put up toll booths to collect money from those who tried to cross. After his third conviction for fraud, Parker was eventually sentenced to life at Sing Sing Prison in New York, where he spent the last years, uh, eight years of his life. He dishonestly made a fortune preying on people who foolishly believed his empty words. He not only was an expert salesman, but he realized that many people were gullible and he could use that gullibility to his advantage. Now, this type of deception is at the heart of temptation. Getting something that you have no right to have at a price too good to refuse. Getting something you have no right to have at a price too good to refuse. And then later on discuss uh, the uh, terms of, and conditions after the purchase is made. See, the devil is a master of exploiting the gullible and self-serving nature of sinful men and sinful women. I think of this other, talk about temptation, a minister uh, parked his car in a uh, no parking spot and he left a note on the car saying, I have circled around the area 10 times and I could not find a parking space. I am going to be late and so I am parking here. And then he wrote, please forgive us our trespasses. The police officer found this note and he left a citation for this preacher's mistake of parking and also wrote a note for the minister. When the, when the preacher came back to his car, he found the note saying, I am a police officer. I go around this block for 10 years. And if I do not give you a ticket, I will lose my job. Lead us not into temptation. Amen. <laughs> a little bit of tit for that. Tit. Now, we're going to talk about temptation this morning. Uh, and we understand that it's something that's common to all of us. But it is very quickly, and this is not my message, but I do need to point out that it, it's important to know the difference between temptations that are designed to strengthen our faith that come from God outside in and and temptations that are designed, designed to sabotage our future, these are, instilled, these are a devil related and they work on our inside trying to cause us to do what is wrong. If you notice in chapter number one, verse number two, these are the, there are good temptations where God allows there to be temptations or trials upon our lives to strengthen our faith, to trust him more. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers or various types of temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience 
patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And if you notice in verse number 12, same chapter, blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath pr promised to them that love him. Now these are good temptations that God allows into our lives or trials to cause us to lean on him more, on us less, and experience the power of God in our lives. But now verses 13 through 15 are not these types of temptations. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Now these, these are the sinful types of temptations. Get, trying to lure us into getting that which we have no right to have or do that which we have no right to do because it's too easy or the price is just too good. But every man is tempted, the Bible says, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I want to bring a simple message this morning from the Bible, how to defeat temptation. Let me say, number one, and these are temptations that are designed to sabotage our future. Number one is acknowledge the reality of temptation. If we're going to defeat temptation, we need to acknowledge the reality of temptation. If you look at verse 14 where the Bible says, but every man is what? Tempted. Every man is tempted. A young priest was serving in the confessional booth for the first time and was being watched over by an older priest. At the end of the day, the, the older priest took the young man aside and said, because he was wondering, how did I do? And he said, well, he said, you did okay, but please, when a person finishes confession, you've got to say something other than wow. <laughs> what happened is this young priest did not realize how common sin is. But folks, we understand sin and temptations are real. They're real. One, one, one person said it this way. You will be tempted. The kinds of temptations may change. Candies for kids, sensuality for the young, riches for the middle aged, and power for the aging. The evil one can ring the changes with greater skill than any advertising agency. He knows the Achilles heel of every microbe. You will be tempted continuously. You will be tempted ferociously at times of crisis. Jesus himself was tempted at all points as we are, that is, to commit adultery, to steal, to lie, to kill, and on and on, yet without sin. Therefore, temptation itself need not dismay you. If your Savior's lot, it was your Savior's lot, and it will be yours, as long as you live, you will be tempted. So the first thing, if we're going to defeat temptation, we need to acknowledge the reality of temptation. It is real. Can a brother get a witness on that this morning? It is real. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, all of us are tempted very similar. Now, we may not believe that to be true, and that's what the devil wants you to believe. He wants you and I to think that either, A, we are not really tempted, or we, but, but honestly, we know we are. We all get tempted. That's the way the, the devil works. But he wants us to think somehow or another that you are unique and that you're the only one that faces certain battles and that's simply untrue. Oswald Chambers rescues this concept of temptation from its totally negative environment when he writes these words in his classic devotional, My Utmost for His Highest. Here's what he said. The word temptation has come to mean something bad to us today, but we tend to use the word in the wrong way. Temptation itself is not sin. It is something we are bound to face simply by virtue of being sinful humans. Not being tempted would mean that we are already so shameful that we would be beneath contempt. Temptation is not something that we can escape. In fact, it is essential to the well-rounded life of a person. Beware of thinking that you are tempted as no one else. What you go through is the common inheritance of the human race. Not something that no one has ever before endured. God does not save us from temptation. He sustains us in the midst of them. Amen. Here's what the devil does. He tempts us. Amen. We do what's wrong, and he tells God on us. <laughs> and he makes us think we're the source of the temptation. He tempts us, 
We do what's wrong. He tells on us. And he makes us feel like we are the ultimate source of the temptation. Hebrews 2.18, the Bible says, talking about Christ, for, he, he, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or nourish or sustain them that are tempted. So how can we defeat temptation? Number one, acknowledge the reality of temptation. Number two, assume the responsibility for temptation. We need to secondly assume the responsibility for temptation. Notice, if you will, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Will Rogers, a cowboy of many years ago, said, there are two great movements in the history of America. The first is a passing of the buffalo, and the second is a passing of the buck. We like to do that, don't we? We like to pass the buck. Uh, it's not my fault while I mess up. It's not my fault while I do wrong. It's not my fault while if a person is, is in, in, engrossed in sin and overcome with sin or fighting bitterness or anger or, or whatever the sin might be. It's always somebody else. You ever no, notice that in our day and time? It's always somebody else. There's always an excuse. A Christian writer had this to say on the subject. We cannot exaggerate the harm that has come to individuals from the teachings of Sigmund Freud, that those who misbehave are simply sick. We do not hold people responsible, after all, for catching the flu, or measles, or having cancer. We have hospitals, not prisons, for the physically sick, simply because they bear no moral blame for their illness. The reprehensible Freudian implication is clear. If we are not responsible for physical illness, why should we be blamed for crime or symptom of mental illness? Now, truth of the matter is, we are born with a sin nature and a nature that loves to sin. However, no one is born with a specific sinful lifestyle that is beyond their control and beyond their responsibility. Sinfulness is a devilish deception, but make no bone about it, no sin could ever be categorized as a disease. The shifting of blame began with our first parents in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, where we find the fall after the fall, after Adam and Eve had sinned, immediately they begin to shift the blame or pass the buck. And he said, uh, and he said, Who told thee, God talking to Adam, that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, and that, that, that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, Well, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. It's her fault. And the Lord God said unto the woman, Well, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, Well, it's the serpent that beguiled me, and I did eat. Now, I never want to feel sorry for the devil, right? I never feel sorry for the devil. This is the only place in all of the Bible where I come, maybe a microcosm, at least feel a little bit sorry for him. Now, he's the culprit of all of it. So you got Adam who said, and he said, it's her fault. And Eve who said, it's the devil's fault. And then God looks at the devil, and he's, who's he going to blame? You know, it is his fault, right? But the idea is that each one of us needs to take responsibility for temptation. In 1 John chapter 1, the Bible says, If we say that we have no sin, what does the Bible say? We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Oh, the devil is a master of saying, it's really not that bad of a sin. And really, is it a sin? Really, is it wrong? You want to do it, don't you? You want to have it, don't you? It's right there within reach, don't you? No one will ever know. No one will ever find out. That's a lie, he would say. That's just a lie. You know, it's something the devil makes you sign a contract, but he won't let you read the small print. <laughs> And then when the consequences come, the devil says, I didn't tell him to do that. Right. Matter of fact, he goes a step farther. He reports us to our higher authority. Mm -hmm. So how do I defeat temptation? Number one, acknowledge the reality of temptation. Number two, assume the responsibility for temptation. And then number three, anticipate the routine of temptation. Yeah. We can anticipate the routine of temptation. One writer said, people don't lead moral lives one day and have an affair the next. Right. It may appear that way but it is a process. 
The process is often overlooked because some stages are not obvious to us, the viewer, and thus they are difficult to detect. That's why it seems to happen overnight. Any of us could be in the process right now. None of us are immune. The earlier danger signals can be detected and responded to, the easier it is to change direction. If you love potato chips and know that you can't stop eating them until the bag is empty, you are better off to never take the first bite. Some steps on the road to immorality are not wrong in and of themselves, yet those very steps may be the first potato chip for some people. Now, I read this person. I almost didn't share that. Why? I love potato chips. And that's a, man, that one hits, that one hits close to home. So what are the, what's the routine of temptation? You know, it's very predictable, and it's common. The, it, the routine for you is the same for me. It's the same for all of us. Isn't that amazing? We are all unique, completely designed, divine design. But the devil uses the same exact strategies on all of us. But yet he makes, it, makes us feel like it's unique. But it's not. There's a pattern. Yes, Step number one is enticement. Step number one is enticement. Notice verse 14 where the Bible says, But every man is tempted when he is what? Drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The bait is placed near the Christian. The bait is placed near the Christian. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus said this about man in verse 21 through 23. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. See, the desires or yearnings we experience are not in and of themselves wrong. God has created the earth and all that is in it for our enjoyment and pleasure. What is wrong is that we, are, we often try to satisfy our cravings in ways that are inappropriate or unhealthy and are certainly contrary to God's word and God's will for our lives. Entice belongs to the world of the fishermen and means lured by bait. Homer Kent summarizes the being drawn away and enticed this way. He said, combining both concepts and viewing them as metaphors of a fisherman, one can visualize the fish being aroused from its original place of safety and repose and then being lured to the bait that hides the fatal hook. So we have enticement. Step number two, entrapment. Entrapment. Verse number 15, the Bible says, Then when lust hath what? Conceived. The Christian is now attracted to the bait. Now, I imagine the Garden of Eden, that was not the first time Eve looked up at that fruit and said, hmm, that's awful pretty. I wonder, wonder why we can't eat that. Hmm. The devil had his notepad out. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. He comes back to her again. Hmm. I wonder why we can't eat that. Hmm. The devil's there again. Hmm. -hmm. Okay. Next thing you know, oh, Eve. Hi. Oh, hi. What you looking at, Eve? Oh, nothing. Had God told you, Eve, that you... Can't eat of anything here in the garden? He already knew, didn't he? He takes notes. The Christian begins to think about the sin and dwell on the sin and eventually commits the sin in his mind and in his heart. The Bible says in Genesis 3, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, that's when she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, the Bible says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already. Where? In his heart. See, it's the second look and continued thought that triggers the trap. What makes temptation, what makes resisting temptation difficult for many people is that they don't want to discourage it completely. Yes, Let me give you step number three is endorsement. Endorsement. Again, verse number uh, 15. And when it, it hath conceived, what does the Bible say? It bringeth forth what? Sin. Sin. The Christian takes the bait. 
The illustration that James uses in verse 15 is of a woman with child. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth, it gives birth to what? Sin. Now the devil doesn't tell you and I that. He just wants to feed that which we're not supposed to have at a price that makes it affordable. Sin is the union of the will with the lust. Indulging temptation brings about an inevitable result. See, just as a child is a person before it is ever born, so sin is present in the heart before it ever gives evidence that it is there. The conception of, of the sin and the discovery of the sin may be many months apart, but the process has been set in motion. No one falls into sin. Everyone that falls into sin slid into sin. Step number four, enslavement. Enslavement. Notice verse 15 again. It brings forth sin. And sin, what does the Bible say? When it is finished. Notice who's in control now. Sin, when it is finished. It is calling the shots now. By this stage, you and I are no longer in control. At this stage, you and I are no longer able. We, and that's the devil's lie. Oh, I, you, you can just keep doing that. You can keep looking at that. You can keep acting that way. You can keep feeling that way. No one's ever going to know. No one ever find out. You're okay. You're an exception to the rule. You're too smart. Guess who's in control at this time? Sin is. The only reason why we haven't fallen yet is because sin is not finished. It's continuing to do damage on us on the inside. It's continuing to set uh, us up for greater failure. It's continuing to make our demise that much more historic. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The Christian is captured. A pastor once wrote, you can choose how you want to live. You are free to choose the actions, but not the results. You are free to have your kicks, but not to avoid the kickbacks. You are free to make choices, but not to avoid the consequences. Doesn't death have such a ring of finality to it? It signifies an ending and absence of true life. The completed process of temptation has brought death to many marriages. The completed process of temptation has brought death to many bright and promising futures, the success of many promising careers, the happiness of many Christian homes, the unity of many soul-winning churches, and the testimony of many of God's people. A well-known author once told this story of an account he had with seagulls. He said, several years ago, our family visited Niagara Falls. It was spring and ice was rushing down the river. As I viewed the large blocks of ice flowing toward the falls, I could see that there were dead fish embedded in the ice. Gulls by the score were riding down the river, feeding on the fish. And as they came to the brink of the falls, their wings would go out and they would escape from the falls. He said, I watched one gull which seemed to delay and wondered when it would leave. It was engrossed in the fish, despite the fact it was getting ready to head over the falls. And when it finally came to the brink of the falls, out went its powerful wings. The bird flapped and flapped and even lifted the ice partly out of the water. And I thought, well, this bird is going to escape narrowly, but escape. But it had delayed too long so that its claws had frozen into the ice. The weight of the ice was too great, and the gull plunged into the abyss. How sad that even though the bird had plenty of time to fly away, because it delayed, it paid the price. Now think of this story in terms of the Christian life. See, when we become overly enthralled with the things of this world, they can bring us down and cause our spiritual death. The finest attractions of this world become deadly when we become overly attached to them. If we cannot give up the things of this world and focus on Christ, we cannot be used by him. Our eyes must ever be upward, setting our affection on things above, opposed to downward, things of this earth. How can I defeat temptation? Number one, acknowledge the reality of temptation. Number two, assume the responsibility for temptation. Number three, anticipate the routine of temptation. And then number four, activate the replacement of temptation. Activate the, the replacement. Look at verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is where? From above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now this verse is pivotal in this whole discussion. See, up to this point, we have been concentrating on the evil of temptation. 
Now, James turns a page to the goodness of God, reminding us that anything fulfilling, anything worthwhile, anything good or proper is found in the Lord. See, in contrast to evil enticements that come from within us, all good gifts come from God who is over and above us. So instead of resisting what the Bible teaches, the devil will get you and I to try to resist. He'll try to get you and I to, to, to uh, have a New Year's resolution once again and try to, uh, I'm going to make up my mind. This is the last time. I'm not going to say that anymore. I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to think this anymore. Uh, it's, it's all done. It's all over. I've made up my mind. It doesn't work. He, he will even, he'll even get to, behind your back and say, you got that right. You make up your mind and you stop doing this. You know why? Because he knows in the flesh we can only stop for so long, but we've not really got the answer yet. We're still working against him in the flesh and what he's going to do is wait for us to get weak again or 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 think we're strong and then he's going to catch us off guard and then we're going to fall even farther than we were before and now we're completely ashamed and defeated and we just give up and now he has you so instead we refocus we refocus we don't resist we refocus we should not only refrain from thinking about gratifying our desires, don't miss this now, but should also avoid thinking about not gratifying our desires. Do not give this any thought at all, period. Let me show you what the Bible teaches us. The way to deal with temptation is not to grit our teeth and make up our minds that we will not do a certain thing, the key is to fill our minds with other things. Sure. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are of just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be uh, any virtue, and if there be any praise, what does the Bible say? Think on these things. Think on these things. Yeah. So I'm not trying to resist. I'm trying to refocus. And I'm not trying to not think of something. I'm trying to on purpose put in my mind that which should be there to begin with. Amen. See, sometimes the more you fight a feeling, the more it grabs you. What you resist in your own strength tends to persist in its own strength. See, we are saved by a power that is not only greater than our sin, but it is also greater than our temptations. Amen. Since temptation begins with your inner thoughts, changing your thoughts is the key to the victory. Good. Give me an example of this. Our dog who is now in dog heaven, if there's such a place, <laughs> blessing, she was a little toy tot rat terrier. Blessing when it came to chicken and treats was immoral. That dog was a, was a very moral dog, except when it comes to chicken and treats. I mean, she was the most thuggish of a dog. I mean, she had a very checkered past when it comes to chicken, when it comes to treat. I mean, she was a bad influence on other dogs when it comes to chicken and when it comes to treats. That was a vice that she could never, uh, she just could never get control of. And so I'm trying to train Blessing to overcome the temptation of not getting into stuff when she has the opportunity. There were times where I was training her and I'd put what she wanted, chicken or treat, and I'd put it on her head. My family would have to leave the room, and they thought I was being the most cruel person in the world. But I was trying to help Blessing be a good Christian dog, amen? And so I'd put it on her head. Oh, and she knows it's there. And she's just waiting to kind of, you know. I'm like, no, Blessing, Blessing, no, no, no. And she'd sit there. Blessing, no. Blessing. Now, the key to blessing, not falling into sin. She couldn't try to resist that chicken on her head or that treat on her head. But she had to look me square in the eye the whole time. And as long as blessing maintained eye contact with me, her master, so to speak, you know, owner of a dog, she looked at me in the eyes. As long as she could stay focused on me, she forgot all about what was, what was on her head. And when I said, okay, blessing, then, of course, you know, she fulfilled the lust of her dog flesh and would eat the treat. <laughs> See, think about this. What is the key for you and I? How many things has the devil put on our head? It's right there. 
is to make sure we stay in eye contact with the master. William Barclay, the famed Bible teacher many years ago, said, the Christian can so hand himself over to Christ and to the spirit of Christ that he is cleansed of evil desire in that moment. Not completely, not sinless perfectionism, but while we are submitted to the spirit, Holy Spirit of God, walking in the spirit, our focus is where it needs to be. In that moment, he could be so engaged in good things that there was no time or place left for wrong desires. It is idle hands uh, for which Satan finds mischief to do. It is an unexercised mind which plays with the desire and an uncommitted heart which is vulnerable to the appeal of lust. What does the Bible say in Romans chapter 12? Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil. How? With good. So how can we overcome temptation? Acknowledge the reality of it, assume the responsibility of it, anticipate the routine of it, activate the replacement, and last of all, accept the reason for our temptation. Notice in verse number 18. Of his own will he begat us, talking about God, talking about us who are born-again Christians, with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Do you know why... We are tempted because we belong to God, then the devil hates our God. And the only way the devil can hurt God is by bringing down his kids. The devil will try to make you and I trophies of disgrace. That's the only thing he can do to hurt God the Father. It is because we are God's special people that we are targets of the enemy. One writer said the danger lies in the possibility that we might be tricked into doubting the authenticity of our relationship with Christ on the basis of the fact that we struggle with sin. The truth is the struggle itself is proof that God is very close to us. Our sensitivity to sin is a gift of God's spirit. It is a sign of our salvation. There would be no inner battle if we were truly lost. Only when we can sin without remorse, with no experience uh, of inner tension, only when sin has become easy for us are we in real danger. But the fact that you and I are, are, are feel a sense of embattlement and, uh, and I feel a sense of shame and a sense of guilt and we know this is wrong. Hey, listen, that is a gift of God. It's a check angelite that turns on and it's not saying that something is wrong. Listen, in the Christian life is a whole different paradox. It's, it's not that something is wrong. It's something's not right. Right, right. Greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world. We overcome evil with good. And so when we do what's right, the wrong is defeated. See, God is way more powerful than the devil, and the Holy Spirit is way more powerful than our flesh. And so if I submit to God and I follow God, the devil has to flee, and sin cannot have dominion because of the power of the Holy Spirit that is not only powerful enough to forgive me of all my sins, but to sustain me over temptation. So when I'm struggling, instead of me saying what's wrong, I need to step back and say what's not right. So once I begin to uh, implement that which is right in my life according to the word of God, temptation in that moment is gone. Doesn't the Bible say that if we walk in the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh? It doesn't say stop fulfilling the lust of the flesh so you can walk in the spirit. It doesn't say that. It says, walk in the Spirit first. Then you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what is our game plan, Pastor? Can we we have a game plan? What can I do? How can we battle this thing? Well, let me say, here's a strategy. It's something we can go home with. Fight back through faith. Fight back through faith. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. So fight back through faith, submitting to God, trusting in God. Secondly, follow your leader. Follow your leader. James chapter 4, again, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. If I am struggling with bitterness, anger, doubts, 
lust, envy, greed, apathy, whatever it is. That's not okay. God's not saying that's I approve of this message. He's saying something's not right. Remember, I have to own that. And so I follow my leader. I submit. For you're unto where you called, 1 Peter 2, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So fight back through faith. Follow your leader. Flee without second thoughts. Flee without second thoughts. When you, when you flee temptation, don't leave a forwarding address. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Wherefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. For 2 Timothy 2, 22, Paul told Timothy, Flee also, you full lust. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, Abstain from all what? Appearance of evil. Flee. You don't have to pray about it. Flee. Run away from it. Get away from it. Don't make excuses. Don't rationalize. Don't worry about what anybody thinks. Just get away from it. Flee from it. Do you all remember when Mount St. Helens, or at least for some of you reading about it, some of us might remember when it happened. When Mount St. Helens blew up, like a whole top of the mountain, and, and Washington State was gone. There was a fellow living on that mountain. He became pretty famous for being foolish, Harry Truman, not the president, but a different Harry Truman. And, and the, they knew something was going to happen weeks in advance. Something was really going bad, the smoldering, the, a lot of volcanic activity going on in that, in, that, in that mountain. And they were trying to get people to evacuate. And the warnings were all there. All the signs were there. But Harry would not move. He's, and they couldn't make anybody go. He, he, he wasn't really, I've been living here all these years, and nothing's ever happened yet. i got plenty of time, and I'm not going to listen to all this. I, I'm going to be okay. I'm Harry Truman. I've been living here all these years. Nothing can happen to me. And so people were evacuating, and literally everyone that they, were, that they knew of who had an address on or near Mount St. Helen, if I'm right, left, except one person. Harry Truman. And guess what took place? The mountain blew. And no one knows where Harry Truman is today. We need to flee. The story is told about a ship captain who had a route that ran from California to Columbia. One day as he was preparing to leave California, he was approached by some drug peddlers, drug dealers, who offered him $50,000 to allow a small shipment of drugs on his vessel. He immediately said no. On each of his next three trips, they raised the offer, finally reaching $150,000. He hesitated, then he said maybe. But as soon as he was alone again, he contacted the FBI, and they set up a sting operation and successfully arrested the drug dealers. One of the agents asked the captain, why did you wait until they offered you $150,000 before contacting us. Here's what's his reply. Because they were getting awfully close to my price. We need to flee. Let me say, fourth of all, fellowship with do rights. Guard your acquaintances. Fellowship with do rights. Proverbs 13, 20. He that walk with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. My wife and I have covenanted we will not be in close fellowship with men who hate their wives, will love them, Amen. and talk down against their wives. I'm not going to want to be around a man no. who's constantly criticizing his wife, no. calling her bad names, telling her how lousy she is. No. No, do under, under, you know what I mean? Just saying, I, I want to get a divorce. I don't, I don't believe in marriage. Why would I want that influence on me? My wife is covenant as well. She's not going to be around ladies that run down their husbands all the time and talk about a lazy or sorry. You know, we want to be around people that, that love each other, that, that are happily or working at least, working on their marriages and want to stay married. Why? We want to have good uh, fellowship. We, we wanted our children. We didn't want our kids to be, you know, we didn't teach our kids they're better than anybody. We certainly know that. But, but why would I want my child to be close to someone that thinks parents are stupid? And that thinks that sin is fun, and that teachers are dumb, and, and all, you know what I mean? And, and they are bent to do what's wrong and be secretive and be liars. Yeah, right. Why would I want my kids to be around people that on purpose rebel and they, and they don't care what the authority is saying? And they're going to they're gonna sneak around and drink or sneak around and smoke or right. stink around and watch something they're not supposed to watch and say, look, as long as nobody finds out we're okay. Yeah, you got it. 
Look, nobody gets away ultimately. No one gets away ultimately. No one. Fellowship. Don't just stay away from that, those that could bring you down. On purpose, surround yourself with people that will bring you up. I want to be around people that will challenge my faith. I want to be around people that are going to sharpen my faith. I want to be around people that are farther down the road than I am to give me someone to patter myself after. Amen. And then, let me say lastly, feed on the truth. Here's what Jesus said. He answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Psalm 119, 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Faith coming by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. I need to get in this book. Amen. You know, it would be a good thing if I took quality time that I could give to a ball game on TV or a program on TV or my Facebook catching up on all the Facebook stuff or Pinterest or Instagram or whatever it is. Can I ever give that same quality of attention to the Word of God? You know, the devil never... Now, I like old Westerns. I will admit that to you. I like old Westerns. They're good Christian people. No, I'm just kidding about that. But, uh, you know, the devil never... I never get tired when I'm watching a Western. I never get distracted, right? But if I were to turn it off and start reading my Bible, all of a sudden my mind wants to wander... I have a hard time focusing because the devil battles that. You know what? Sometimes it's good to do that, which we know the devil's going to fight us doing. Amen. And we say, God, by faith, because I love you, I'm going to do this. Amen. I'm going to feed myself with your word. So how to defeat temptation? Acknowledge the reality of temptation. Assume the responsibility for temptation. Anticipate the routine of temptation. Activate the replacement of temptation and then accept the reason for your temptation. Many times the overwhelming presence of temptation is a spiritual check engine light in our lives. Any sound mechanic knows that the sooner a driver discovers why this came on, the better and less expensive the repair potentially. The strong presence of the negative in our lives, lives is often a result of the absence of the spiritual positive. Here's what's amazing. You and I at any given time can reset that. And the devil will tell you you can't. You can. You can reset that. Submit yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Reset. We sing about the special. God changes everything, right? God's a transformer. And he can do that for me. And he can do that for you. Father, I pray you bless in our time of invitation this morning. I believe a very important subject in our day and time is we have so much around us to allure us away from you, allure us away from our families, allure us away from truth. But, Father, you are greater that sits within us and he that's within the world. I pray you speak to hearts and help us to be resolved to defeat temptation, not in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand to our feet, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If